and very excited to be here with you all tonight for the Sonia Sanchez series that we are doing in partnership with the Kentucky Women Writers Conference. And we have our sister Patrice Muhammad with us, joining us from Lexington, Kentucky. And she will come and more formally introduce uh, the series and our speaker here momentarily. But let me just say, this is the first year that we've done the Sonia Sanchez series um, at the University of Louisville at the Ann Braden Institute, but it has been a long-standing series um, that has brought in a number of powerful speakers. The series, of course, is named after Sonia Sanchez, the legendary poet from the Black Arts Movement, um, and the series attempts to honor her work and to also lift up writing and poetry as a form of activism and social justice work. And so we bring in speakers who uh, speak to that intersection, who have used their voice and used their pen and their writing as a form of not only artistry, but activism, and to be able to speak to that about what that looks like, because there's mul there are multiple ways to do activist and justice work. Some of it is policy, some of it is agitating in the streets, but some of it is also um, within the academy, but some of it is in artistry. And so there are a number of ways to make interventions into the injustices that we see in the world. And some of that is through writing, and we wanna lift that up with this series. And so we are very excited to have with us tonight a writer from Detroit who is quite prolific. And her name is Jessica Caremore. You probably already know of her because she is nationally acclaimed and globally renowned. She has been on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam, which is where I first encountered her before meeting her in person at, at the Ohio State University at the Hip Hop Literacies Conference, where uh, she was already doing, I think, Black Girls Rock and Black Girl Juice. I bought a Black Girl Juice t-shirt. And uh, just so glad to have met her. What a dynamic poet that she is. And she, I'm sure she will talk about later, but just wrote a, a, a poem honoring uh, the new Supreme Court uh, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson that has gotten picked up by the likes of Oprah Winfrey and circulated. And so you know the Oprah effect is going to put you out there even more than you already are. And so that just happened last night and this morning. And so we are so glad to have her with us uh, tonight. And we will hear from Jessica Caremore, and then we will have opportunity to have questions and answers and a little bit of dialogue from her when that uh, portion of the program um, has concluded. And now I want to hand it over to my co-convener and organizer, uh, Ms. Patrice Muhammad, who is the longtime director of the Sonia Sanchez series and committee member of the Kentucky Women Writers Conference. Patrice. Thank you so much, Dr. McCormick. Brandon, as I like to call him. <laughs> Thank you so much. Again, I am Sister Patrice Muhammad, President-Elect of the Kentucky Women Writers Conference, which is the oldest women writers conference in the country. Each year we host an activist writer in the name of Sonia Sanchez. Sister Sonia is a brilliant poet, educator, and scholar co-founder of both the Black Arts Movement and of Black Studies at the college level at 87 years young. She lives and writes in Philadelphia, PA. Sonia's influence in Kentucky is immeasurable, as is our guest today's influence in the state of Kentucky, Jessica Caremore. This is her second time as the Sonia Series keynote speaker. Jessica is a full-time artist and mother. No shade to anybody who, you know, they work, work in the academy and do some other things along with their writing. But let me tell you, Jessica is a full-time artist and mother in no particular order. She is a poet, playwright, publisher, producer, filmmaker, and rock star. Her image, voice, and poetry were among the opening exhibits in the National African American History Museum in Washington, D.C. 
As Brandon mentioned, her poem honoring the next and first Black woman Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson was shared yesterday by media mogul and philanthropist Oprah Winfrey. Jessica has her own recorded album, Black Tea, The Legend of Jesse James, and appeared in person and recorded with hip hop artists including Common, Nas, Jeezy, and Talib Kweli, and one of my favorites also, non-hip hop artist, jazz artist, Roy Ayers. She's executive director and performer in Black Women Rock. Jessica is the author of several books, The Words Don't Fit in My Mouth, The Alphabet Versus the Ghetto, God is Not an American, Sunlight Through Bullet Holes, We Want Our Bodies Back, and the memoir, Love is Not the Enemy. Born in Detroit, Jessica represents her city, our city, in both word and deed. Please join me in welcoming this world traveling wordsmith who is hip hop, funk, and rock and roll, our dear sister, my dear sister, Jessica Care Moore. Thank you. Can y'all see me? Yes. <laughs> I, I, see, I see you, and I see our brother Brandon, and I see. Um, and I see a lot of um, people with their initials. <laughs> so uh, I want to just say thank you so much. I appreciate um, both of you. Kentucky Women's Writers Conference is a, such an important conference for me. When I was first asked, this is my second time doing the Sonia Sanchez keynote. So just honored to be asked more than once because um, there's a lot of poets and writers who would love to do a keynote that has mom, we call her Mama Sonia or Sister Sonia's name attached to it. So really honored. Um, Dr. McCormick, thank you so much um, for being a partner in this, and for the university to come on board. And I really, really wanted to come in person. So I'm hoping that we can uh, manifest that reality uh, maybe in the fall. So I like Louisville a lot, actually. And I've, when I've been there with Patrice and spent time there, um, we saw beautiful horses and um, really beautiful community there and, and really, really wonderful writers there that I got to meet. So happy when I got, I want to just mention when I was first asked to do this many years ago, I was in a transitional space in my life. So my son King, who's here, not making noise for the next 90 minutes, um, is 15 now. He was a baby. And I was um, just in le leaving uh, a marriage. And it was a very, very, what my friend calls a very coarse time in my life. And so when I got the letter, I think I still have the letter, to the invitation to do the Kentucky Women's Writers Conference and to actually do the Sonia Sanchez keynote, I, I literally, I, I, I cried. And normally I don't cry for getting a gig because <laughs> it's, it's work to me. Um, but I was in such a space of not feeling 100% as good as I feel about myself right now, as good as I feel about my work um, normally. I was in a very kind of a sad space. And so that invitation was one of the things that propelled me and like made me like wake up and go, hey, Jessica, somebody remembers who you are. And even though there's energy around you that's trying to get you to think that you're not important or not necessary, um, somebody says that's different. And so just thank you for that moment because I will never forget it. Like it really absolutely helped me, push me, because um, I had just had a baby. So when you're an artist and a mother who's been not working because people stop calling you when you're pregnant. It's the most interesting thing. I'm like, but I need money. <laughs> so, you know, especially when you're becoming a mom, you know, but people are like, oh, well, you know, you're busy pregnant. So we're not going to bother you with gigs <laughs> and money <laughs> to help you take care of the child. So, you know, so respectfully, that's just that's something that we need to fix in community, right? That make sure that when women artists um, get pregnant with children or have children, that doesn't mean that they don't want to work and i really worked up until i almost pushed this baby out of me like i was i was big and fat like in my last gig i think i was probably like my stomach was humongous i shouldn't have been on that plane on delta but delta let me go and i did this gig just i wanted to test myself to see how hard i could read these political rowdy poems with a baby inside of me and that's why i have a wild son <laughs> that i have right now to this day so um that to say just this thank you. Really happy to be here. Um, if you guys want to put your cameras on, you can. I understand if you may not be together. I mean, I'm not, I'm really tired because Oprah then called me out at a poem. So I ain't had no sleep. I've been doing interviews and it's been really beautiful. Um, and uh, Microsoft Teams don't let me clean up my appearance. So this is what it is. Okay, it's as pretty as it's going to get this evening. Um, 
but what's important is the poems. So I'm going to read uh, from my, I have uh, my new book, We Want Our Bodies Back. This is my fifth book that came out during the pandemic. Um, my banner is right there. Uh, and, and this is a really important book. This is, I'm going to read from this that I wrote for Sandra Bland is the title piece. And so just to talk for a moment about Mama Sonia Sanchez and Sister Sonia, who I, I'm grown enough where I call her sister, Sister Sonia. Um, she was Mama. She's now, she's Sister Sonia at 87 and she's well. And we speak um, all the time. And what's, you know, she's a Black arts movement legend, as you all should know. And, but what's different about her that's different maybe than other elders is that Sonia reaches back. She reaches, um, she reaches back for us. And, not everyone does that, you know? And and so that's made a difference in my life that I can call Sonia Sanchez, you know, not just this. I was a little black girl at Cody High School reading her poems and books. And then and then I, one day my life, something happened and now I have her phone number. And now I've done countless readings with her over the last 25 years. And she's a dear, dear friend um, to my son. Her and my son shared that I, was, I made my son on her birthday so my son's birthday is September 9th, same same as hers. Um, so she, it's a blessing to do anything in her name. So I only uh, pray that I am worthy, <laughs> to be honest, um, to to read poems with the Sonia Sanchez keynote and more more keynotes with our our giants on them. Like I love that you've named something after her because she deserves it. Um, so I'm going to open with a poem from my fourth book, Sunlight Through Bullet Holes, and um, it's called You Want Poems. And I recorded this um, for my album, Black Tea, Patrice, that has um, Roy Ayers on the record. So Roy Ayers plays on this record. So if y'all haven't gotten my music yet, Black Tea, Talib Kweli put the record out in 2015. And it's a mix of poetry, jazz, and soul. And You Want Poems, Roy Ayers, is, and Jose James is singing on it. So another incredible uh, bright light, an incredible voice on the planet. Um, that you should you should look up if you don't know. So this is called You Want Poems, and it's really about that balance between po. I'm a hopeless romantic. I'm a poet, so we can't help ourselves. But it's the balance between love and poems and activism and motherhood is kind of all wrapped in this poem. And the Smithsonian Museum, if you go to the, the museum, the new museum of African American history in Washington D.C., um, it's there. It's the poem uh, excerpt of the poem comes up on the video screen. So really proud of this poem for that reason too. Okay. When you are a woman, when you are brown, when you are brave, when you walk over glass like water, when you know your eyes are borrowed like time, when you peel off your skin for the very first time, fear is never in style in the Mecca of the blue. Fear never lives in the gut of the new. You want poems and I want to build my home. You want poems and I just want love in my hands. You want poems and I'm not interested in fans. You love me inside my magic, and I just want you to see you already had it. It is the telling when someone asks. It's the way he holds the glass, licks the surface, examines without touching. It's the way our energy takes over rooms. It is the subtle conversation. It is the freedom of emancipated language. It is words scribbled inside my skin. It's the curve of the line, the beauty of the lies. Stories passed down through generations of pain and pride, ocean and tide, water remembers water returns african mermaids blending with dark sand it is the danger of the dance the upright heart of the bass the dice roll drum the symbol tea the last lap the addiction to this moment where else do i put it don't know where to put it place it bury it deep in my chest back of my throat where should i hide it on this stage should i give it to you here is my honesty my work undress legs stretched across piano Traded like cattle, raped like animal, left for dead, suck dry for inspiration, in love with the idea of living long enough to simply write about it, push it out my belly and watch my son slowly grow into it. You said you wanted a poem. Now what you gonna do with it? Huh? Whitney, Etta, Abby, Nina, Phyllis, how much time you got? I'm a body of clocks. I'm a master of mics. I'm the metaphor for survival. I'm the goal they use to build their churches, a beautiful idea to flirt with, but who should I marry? The moonlight, the sunrise, a white dove, a wolf, some Eastern music, a prayer. How many babies we gonna make inside a song? Which revolution, which nation shall we rule? The island of the spirit world, the beauty of the believers, the carpenters, the men who build the dream and place you on the front line of their planet. One day, the stars will line up between breath and ink and voice, between reality and choice. 
It is the danger of the dance, the upright face of the heart, the dice roll drum, the cymbal tease, the last laugh, the addiction to this moment. So, and I say addiction to this moment because it's like, I really feel like that, like I don't have anywhere to put this energy that's been inside of my body because like poetry is craft and, 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 uh, and gift. And, and it's also ancestor work if you're doing it right. <laughs> so you're not, so yeah, you can go to school and get your PhD and you can go get a master's degree, right? And create a writing poetry, but still can't tap into, into the spirit of the poetry. And that's what makes, um, me a child of the black arts movement because i understood there was a connection something greater than just can i write a nice poem but can i summon <laughs> can i summon ancestors can i bring my people onto the stage with me and and can i connect with hearts in ways that other poets who may be able to write well can necessarily touch people and it was so important for me even at a young 22 when i hit the apollo stage I knew that I would be okay at the Apollo, despite the history of the Apollo Theater, because I was with black people in Harlem and I'm from black Detroit. So I wasn't scared of my people. So when someone asked me to read at the Apollo, most people think that's a scary experience. But for me, I was like, I wasn't cocky. I was nervous, but I was like, it's black people in Harlem. They go like my poetry, you know, like anything I didn't expect to win, but I didn't expect them to boo me off stage. Right. Um, because that's been my, those are, those are my community and I write for them. Uh, it doesn't always happen that they, they love you back, but I expected that to happen. And so, um, yeah. And so I, I mean, I'm inspired by my community. People are like, what keeps you going? When someone asked me, what keeps you motivated, Jessica? And I was like, I love my people. You know, I, just like Haki Matabuzi loves his people. They're well pressed in Chicago. You know, these are my mentors. Um, Amiri Baraka, you know, who I love, you know, who we lost. Um, was my friend and my mentor. So I've um, got big shoes to fill in the Zaki Shange. I mean, for Color Girls saved my life. Like I was in a black box theater at Cody High School off Joy Road when my drama teacher, Susan Story, did something, brought somebody called Intazaki Shange. Nobody could say her name. And we were like, who is Intazaki Shange? What's that? And it changed my life. And it changed my life. Someone who ended up, I read and admired, read all her books, ate up me some books of Endozaki Shange. And then to be able to become friends, right? And to become someone that can actually read with her for many years. And I got to spend some time with her before she passed away. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm really blessed. Let me just say that. So I just wanted to read something from Sonic Dibola Hosa. I really want to share my new work <laughs> with y'all. And in the spirit of Amiri Baraka, this piece really reminds me of Amiri and Sonia Sanchez and Lucille Clifton and Jane Cortez. And these are people that came before me. And, I, you know, people in like hip hop, we say, like, you know, you dropping names, you know, like, why are you dropping all their names? And people say that about me forever. But I have to lift up the people who came before me because they did so much work to make it so much easier for me to say, hey, I'm a poet and I'm a black woman poet. And it's still none of it comes easy for us. None of it comes easy. And, you know, I've been joking about being tired, but, you know, like what Oprah Winfrey did for me, like, but Oprah didn't, you know, she did it in a very, like what happened with me, with me and Oprah on that call with Win with Black Women. I'm on this beautiful call that I've been on um, during the pandemic with sisters from all walks of life, a lot of political strategists and, and different folks that they don't always, they're not always in the room with artists like myself who have the same political ideas, who are pushing the same, pushing their platform but they don't know how to utilize us. And this sister, Jotaka Edie, knew, knew my work as a, she was a fan since she was, a, you know, because the Apollo is a place I can't escape and I don't run away from because Jotaka Edie <laughs> was watching me when she was 14 years old. She only 10 years younger than me, but that's where she was at, right? So if I'm 22, that's, you know what I mean? So, and so she's like a fan and she's like, well, you, we need you in this space, Jessica, with Donna Brazil. And these other sisters, you know, like it's important. Whereas some people would never see the connection, right? They separate artists from politics, from when we all have the same community, wanting the same things for our people. And she brought me into a space and I just humbly did what I do. And that's what I tell when I tell people and the people that are on this call, I don't know what, if you're students or whatever, but no matter what, like as long as you are doing your, the work you're supposed to be doing, you don't got to chase after nobody. You don't got to try to get somebody your CD or get even, you know, anybody like your book. You do your work and invest in yourself. People are like, oh, Jessica, you're working so much. And I was like, I'm not really working a lot during the pandemic. 
I'm actually spending time. I'm just investing in myself because I'm my best bet. So I believe in my work. So I invest time and energy into my work, whether I'm making money doing it or not. And the end result is I get to take care of my family and I get to buy a home and get to have a, a decent car and put food on the table and travel when I feel like it. And I'm free. And I've been free for 25 years. And that's a priceless kind of existence. You know, I'm very, very, very blessed. But this is called Where Are the People? It had nothing to do with what I was saying. Um, Where Are the People is a poem I wrote. It's about, I mean, we all dealing with gentrification all over the country. Detroit is no different. Um, Patrice, when you come home, I don't know when the last time you've been here, it's a very different city every two weeks. I'm, I'm almost running into something like, oh, what's that? Um, so it's called Where Are the People? I wrote it for the Cass Corridor. And Patrice would know what the, the Cass Corridor is, this area by Wayne State University that they now call Midtown. And uh, me and my son King were got a pizza from a new pizza spot. They gave us pepperoni. We don't eat pepperoni. So we drove around for about a half an hour up the Cass Corridor, Midtown, looking for a person just to give a pizza to and couldn't find anyone to feed. Now, back in the day, that would have like, back in the day, meaning like, I don't know, less than 10 years ago, maybe six years ago, that would have been very easy to do. And so I wrote this, um, where are the people for the bodies we can no longer locate? Where are the one-way tickets? Who signed the death certificates? Where are the magicians, the madmen, the toothless, the smoothless, the poets? the corner store prophets, the bus stop historians, the traffic stoppers. Where are the people? Where are the blues? Under which pile of gravel? Where are they buried? Hurricane cast corridor, hurricane cast corridor. Where is the soil, the soul, the socks, the soles, the shoes? Where is the heroin? Where are the pills? Where are the women? Where are the thrills? Where is cast corridor? My student asked me, is it a building? Is it that way? Is it this way? Your school is sitting in it. I answer you, is it? The dogs are walking the people. The dogs have parks. The parks don't have children. Where are the people? The stepped over, the forgotten Holocaust, the fragile, the beautiful, the fast talkers, the backward walkers, the 3 a.m. stalkers. Where do they take them? When will they return? Where is the balance? Where is the money? Where are the schools? Where are the people? We all got Wi-Fi. Nobody getting high outside. Where are the beds? Where is their heads? Where are the recognizable street signs? Where is Joe Lewis? Where are the black people? My white neighbor asked me, Jessica, where are the black people? Where are the chosen people? Where are our hearts, our guitars, our bass players, Kenny Mack, Anthony Tolson, rest in peace. Where are the anointed, the children of God? Where is the sage, the holy water? Where is the black imagination located? How much does it cost per square foot to rent there? Is there a rent your own, is there a rent to own your own black imagination option? Where are the couples fighting in the alleys? Where are the purple flavor mad dog 2020 fables? Where are the needles? Where is the good time? Where did all these damn bike lanes come from? Where is the line to simply exist? Where is the painted line to live, to breathe? Where are the parks with swings? Where are the children supposed to live? Where are the children supposed to run? Where are the twilight teas, the moonlight mythology makers? Where are our military vets, our mentally ill? Where are the people? Where are the people? Where are the people? San Francisco, Oakland, Harlem, Detroit, Chicago, do you know? Do you know how? Have you seen them? Do they all die so New Detroit could live? Do they all die so New San Francisco could live? Do they all die so New Harlem could live? Where is your conscience? Where is this nonsense coming from? Where is humanity? Where are the people? The one-way tickets. The message is still in the bottle. Where are the indigenous? Where are the salt mines? Where are the people? Where are the people? Where are the people? Where are the people when you find them? Please tell them. I have an overpriced gentrified cheese and pork pizza with their names on it. Tell them I am writing for them so they won't disappear without a fight. So that's called Where Are the People? And I'm taking off my jacket because y'all, I'm in my house. My house, I pay my heat bill and some more <laughs> because it's Detroit. So if you know it's cold, it's a little cold in the D. Um, but it's actually, but I'm warm. So um, y'all good? We're good? Thank you for y'all to stay. Thank you. I need to see some faces. So thank you for, to Brandon and to my sister Patrice. Um, Ooh, for staying on with me. So I want to do, I'm going to just calm my little self, my energy down <laughs> a little bit. And I'm going to do something a little more quiet. It's not quiet in the way that I can be quiet anyway. Um, I wrote this for Endazaki Shange, um, who likes Sonia Sanchez, who's just informed me. Um, I wasn't as close to Endazaki as I am to Mama, Mama Sister Sonia. Um, but I did get to know her and she reminded me a lot of myself in many crazy, wild, beautiful ways. And this is called I Used to Be a Roller Coaster Girl. Mm. And I wrote this because 
me and Tazaki were in Miami together. I was sitting with Sonia Sanchez and Abiyadun Oyewole and Umar Ben Hassan, a Baba Tunde from The Last Poets, and me and Tazaki. And we there was a, a sister, Aja Monet, a poet, um, had gathered them in Miami to honor them for something called the Maroon Festival. And I, I wasn't like officially invited. She said I could come. I wasn't there working. But when I found out they were going, I was like, oh, I'm going. And I asked, I said, where are they staying? And she said, oh, it's a very expensive hotel downtown Miami, something Miami Beach. I was like, okay, I'm grown. I'm going to stay at that hotel. So I got myself a room for the weekend. And it was the best choice, best thing I ever done in a long time. Um, I went down there. My brother, Brad Waran, fellow poet, met me. And I spent my mornings with Intazaki and Sonia and doing it, Umar and Baba Tunde. And um, we, that was like, in a, I don't know, that was in the summertime. And we lost. In Dazaki that October, you know, so you know, some months later. But after that, we began. She began call, began calling me on the phone. But we, she was just a very wild, beautiful energy, and said all kinds of beautiful, wild things, and um, and didn't have a filter. And so I, she reminded me so much of myself because I just say kind of whatever I want most of the time. Especially the older I get, like the more crazy I become with my language and like my just uninhibitedness and. We were laughing about roller coasters and she said, oh, Jessica, I used to be a roller coaster girl. And I was like, me too. I, but, and we talked about not liking roller coasters as, as women. And so I wrote this for Intazaki. I used to be a roller coaster girl. I used to be a roller coaster girl seven times in a row. No vertigo in these skinny legs. My lipstick bubblegum pink as my panther 10 speed. Never kiss. Nappy pigtails, no brand gem shoes, white line, yellow short shorts, scratched up leg peddling past borders of hummus and baba ganoush, masters and liquor stores, city chicken, pepperoni bread, and Superman ice cream cones. Yellow black blended with bits of Arabic, Islam, and Catholicism. My daddy was Jesus. My mother was quiet. Jane Kennedy was worshipped by my brother Mark. If you're young, you don't know who Jane Kennedy is, you gotta Google her. She was super fine, okay? My mother was quiet. Jane Kennedy was worshipped by my brother Mark. I don't remember having my own bed before 12. Me and my sister Lisa shared. Sometimes all three more girls slept in that queen. You grow up so close, never close enough. I used to be a roller coaster girl, wild child full of flowers and ideas, useless crushes on Polish boys in a school full of white girls. Future black swans singing Zeppelin, U2, and Rick Springfield, hoping to be Jesse's girl. I could outrun my brothers and everybody else to that recurring line. I used to be a roller coaster girl till you told me I was moving too fast, that my rush made your head spin, my laughter hurt your ears, a scream of happiness, a scream of freedom, pouring out my armpits, sweating up my neck. You were always the scared one. I kept my eyes open for the entire trip. Right before the drop, I would brace myself and let that force push my head back into that hard iron seat. My arms nearly fell off a few times, but I kept running back to that line when I was done. Same way I kept running back to you. I used to be a roller coaster girl. I wasn't scared of mountains or falling. Hell, I look forward to flying and dropping off this earth and coming back to life every once in a while. I found some peace in being out of control, allowing the blood to race through my veins for 180 seconds. I earn my sometimes nicotine pull. I buy my own damn drinks and the ocean still calls my name when it fills its toes at my fills my toes at its shore. I still love roller coasters. And you grew up to be afraid of all girls who could ride fearlessly like me. So there's that. Um, and that's just to say that if somebody is trying to take your your joy or trying to make you feel crazy because I don't know, maybe you're over 30 and you still like to wear leather pants. Like, you know, let, let them go, cut them off <laughs> and wear your leather pants. Are we good visually? Can y'all see me? Okay. I'm on the screen. Okay. I just make it sure. Um, nice and big. What'd you say? Yeah, we're good. And nice I'll, and big. Wait, You've got the main. That. Can y'all see that screen. I have, yes, can y'all yes. see that I have pipe cleaners in my hair because I'm black and I got pipe cleaners in my hair. I do, because that makes the locks curl, you know what I'm saying? So I got these little, you know, demi nose. Anyway, so um, this is called I'm Not Ready to Die. And I wrote this. I'm going to, I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to not cuss. I do have an F-bomb in this poem, but respectfully, I'm going to just, you know, y'all know what I'm saying. I'm just going to like, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to just be quiet <laughs> and read the poem. And I, I won't say that bomb but it's called I'm Not Ready to Die. And I wrote it when someone it was some years ago now, called me and said there was a woman artist crawling on the ground at an award show. A woman artist crawling on the ground at an award show who's probably got millions of dollars. And so, not that you just had to be broke to crawl on the ground, 
But I am perplexed when you have <laughs> millions of dollars and you are still crawling on the ground at an award show. So I wrote, I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to die a little more today. My nails are polished, a bright aquamarine. My skin smells like the ocean. In my hair, I'm wearing the flowers he left on my doorstep. Tiger's eye and turquoise are wrapped around my wrist. Do I look like I'm attempting an early death? My headphones sound like Chardé. I wish these new girls would get the, off their knees and transform a room with some subtle power and grace. Chardé doesn't really dance, poet, and that is the point. When did it become okay to die in this country on our knees? The Walking Dead, a 24-hour day spa. Hell, I, they parade in groups. Hell, I need a massage too, but at what price? I got to stand behind a mediocre bar just because the kids rock to it. I've yet to hear an MC destroy the alphabet more gangster than Sonya or Endozaki, so I ain't ready to die today. Won't participate in the spirit massacre of our children. My throat is on fire. My pen is hot. Endozaki is dead. Endozaki will never die. I'm more alive I'm more alive in my 40s. I was not, oh, 40s. I'm more alive at 50 than most of these wannabe Euro, Euro inside out intellectuals. I've graduated from digital slavery masterclass. I read books without screens. I have sex with men my age or not whenever I feel like it. I love my hair, my ass, my breasts. I'm clear my power is between my ears and side my chest. Black girl magic doesn't grow between our legs. This is the mythology of men. How much to get off your knees, sis? This pen is a knife, stabbing out the hearts of dead trees. These trees already dead anyway, a walking dead urban forest. We are surrounded, so I continue to climb to write because I ain't ready to die today or tomorrow. I'ma keep living inside poems. You didn't know what left for you. If you just get off the floor, you can see all these poems, all this royalty, all this world they attempt to kill you with is really your universe to inherit, to change, to rebuild. Get off your knees. Stop crawling for them. Stand up, Queen Latifah, Light, Lauren, Missy Elliott, Left Eye, Bahamadia, Rod Digger, Roxanne, Rhapsody, Sirac, Kay Valentine, Mama Soul, Microphones are not stripper poles. Sonia, Audrey, Maya, and Dezaki, Jane, Lucille, Nikki, Nikki, Tony, Asha, Stacey, Anna, Kira, Mahogany, Elizabeth, Liza, Michelle, me, us, we need you. We need you to stop dying. Stop dying to be less than who you were destined to be. We need you to outlive death in all its forms. Live, 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 so patriarchy can finally die. So there's that. Y'all with me? Hey. <laughs> Appreciate y'all being on the video, so I got to look at the, um, the people, that, the initials. I don't know if the initial people are with me or if they're like federal agents for the government. I don't know. But either way, I hope you guys are enjoying on the Please, y'all, use the chat, too. Use the chat. Use the chat. Oh, yeah, you know, the chat. I see some people throwing some love in the chat, so use okay, the chat. Okay, I want some, some love in the chat would be great. I like it. I like love in the chat. Hold on, y'all. Give me two seconds. I'm going to. Stuff that I have to do. I'm like, that's what happens when you get all excited. Now I'm so warm. I got to turn down the heat of my house so I don't melt in front of y'all. Hey, peace, brother. There we go. Yes, come on. Come on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, energy. Hey. I need it. I mean, y'all understand, like, you know, talking to a green dot, you know what I'm saying, is sucks. <laughs> and so, and I don't, I'm an energy person, so it's good to see your faces, you're beautiful, it helps me um, read. Especially, I want to read this piece um, for Sonia Sanchez. And the clap emojis, too. Hit the clap emojis, you clap know, emojis. Get, a, get all the possible ways to send the energy. I need some, yeah, and I'll take them clap emojis, I'll do all of that, it's all good. And I want to say, thank you, look at all these beautiful faces, don't hide, please. <laughs> this is a poem I wrote. So um, Sonia Sanchez um, openly talks about her vertigo. She struggled. She got stuck in a tornado in Alabama somewhere. We both got Alabama roots. Hi, Br oh, it's Brad Walrine. Hi, Brad. Wonderful poet that just joined us. Um, I'm, I'm publishing Brad Walrine's book, Everywhere Alien. It'll be out in, uh, God willing, summer of 2023 on More Black Press. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited, and he's a really amazing poet, and, you know, years ago, um, Walter Mosley at a book expo in New York um, at the Jacob Javits Center, um, I was working with, at that time, Etan Thomas, who was with the Washington Wizards, told me to stop publishing these people and to get up, he wanted me to stop publishing and to get up every day at four in the morning and write novels. So that's Walter Mosley. He is, yeah. Well, he, well, you know, let me explain why he said it. What he said is the thing that you think you're trying to do by publishing everybody, these spoiled brat writers, um, 
to give to the, you know, because I and he understood why I wanted to do it. He was like, "Well, we need your, we need your work," and 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 so because the, the more you spend taking care of other people's voices, the less you do spend on your own work. But let me just say something about that, and I love Walter Mosley. Um, is that it's just in my I can't help myself. <laughs> I really, really enjoy um, institution building, and I love introducing people to new voices, especially in poetry, um, that uh, that need and deserve space. Um, that's why I created Black on Rock 18 years ago, which is now Daughters of Betty is our new movement. We're actually not Black on Rock anymore. We're Daughters of Betty, powered by Black on Rock, um, because Daughters of Betty. Uh, Do Betty Davis died in February. She's transitioned. And so with her transition, I was already transitioning the name so that we can do the work in her name. And um, so it's deeper than just like some cool hashtag of Black of Rock. It's more about the movement of Daughters of Betty and up uplifting her name and also continuing the legacy of what she was about and creating scholarships um, for girls, but leaning in towards Black and Brown girls who don't have access to um, instruments inside schools and um, giving money and scholarships, you know, and, and mentorship through the women that I work with who are internationally known to get them to learn how to play bass and electric guitar. And so we want more guitar players. We want more black girls playing guitar in the world. And so that's what's one of the one of the initiatives that we're working on um, and doing successfully. Um, so this is called Vertical Woman. And thank you again for coming on because I could see more people. Um, and it's for Sonia Sanchez. I wrote this on her 80th birthday. And it was funny, it was in Brooklyn and it was um, a very big event. Everybody was everybody. I remember Raz Baraka had just, I think Raz had just become mayor. He was there. Um, I was there. Okay. You were there, Patrice. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a long time. I can't remember. You know, yeah, I can't remember. But And but, I remember your memorable mic stand. Okay. And that's what I, yeah, the story. Good. So you were there. So you people know I'm not lying about this because you can't make this up. So what's funny is like, you know, the young people had the, they were like running the show and I had written this like poem that I'm about to share with you. It was fresh off the press, right? So I'm a real poet. Like I just wrote the poem. I didn't read some poem from a long time ago. I wrote a new poem for Sonia. So they didn't have a mic stand. They were about to hand me that microphone. I said, well, how am I, I got six papers to go. How am I hold my papers? You don't have a music stand. You don't got a mic stand and I got to hold the paper. And so Omari Hardwick, who's a wonderful actor and a friend of mine um, and a poet in his own right, um, was on his way. And he had been texting me and said, Jessica, wait, is she there? You know, you're about to read, wait. You know, he wanted to see me read. He wanted to see Ursula read. And he was on his way. And I said, yes. And so I looked around to the little young people who were running the show. And I said, don't worry about it. I have a mic stand. He's on his way. And they were like, who is she talking about? <laughs> and so um, Omari comes in. I'm like, yo, I need you to do a favor. I need you to hold my papers so I can read this poem. And so Omari very dramatically comes on stage with me and I think he was like holding my neck. He's so crazy, holding the paper. It was very dramatic. He became this human mic stand, very good looking one at that. And as I read, he would hold it and I could just let it fall on the ground. And it was the best moment, that was funny. But the best thing that happened after that was Mama Sonia Sanchez who came up to me, who had not read yet. It was getting tributed the whole night, of course, for her birthday, said, will you let Omari Harwick know that he can hold my, he can be my mic stand when I go up there, too. And it was just like the best vote in the world. I was like, so oh, yeah. She's like, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm fine with that. And I was like, I love her so much. Um, so, yeah. So this is, what, you know, she's 87 now. So, right. This is her 80th birthday. Um, vertical woman. Because we, so I talked about her vertical a bit. So I suffer from a bit of vertical myself. Um, and so I have that that bond with her. Um, we are all spinning while standing still. All at once, us vertical women, birthed from the cosmic Afro-futuristic tornado wombs of street corner theater and par robes and baritone, deep guttural Alabama DNA tested for being the temperature of the equator on the ninth day of September, Sonia Sanchez turned 87, and that is very hot. You have rescued so many of us under a soprano sky, us 
blue, black, magical women from the bowels of mainstream beauty. We sisters dreaming just to be loved honestly with the nose and breasts and lips we were born with to be safe in the house of a friend. Our internal wounds salted and licked by exile wolves whose spirit kill women who read books, who create sanctuary in their own home, who find joy in the discovery of their own bodies like the singing coming off drums. You allowed us our own image as necessary mirror, as template, as model. Everything is not a thin, collapsed American nightmare. You promise this is not a small voice. While holding our dreams in your throat, cocoons turn to butterflies when you speak. You told us you told us there was something left behind, something priceless we could spit out and shine off and share with our daughters, something they could never silence, poems. You have pulled us closer to our ancestors with grace. You made them more accessible. You literary goddess in a den of language thieves, a fortress of love, a ginger tea, a warm miso soup. You break the sky open with your sunsets of peace. Pull haiku from your curls and carry them as children. Say them backwards sometimes just to see if the story ends up the same way. There is balance in all things. Shake loose our skin so the mask is no longer necessary. Make it wearable art, make it glow. Your poems know so we can hear how train would have played it. Your poems laugh so that we can recognize Malcolm's smile on the page. You challenge us to be more human, to become who we say we are as a people. You are a giant among the dwarf ears of misogyny, our feminine genius, our sister Sonia, who is the color of Bahia. Sonia, who is the silver panther matriarch of black art. Sonia, the pantheon of poetics, a structured sound of meter mixed with machete, rapid fire brilliance and soft warrior resistance kisses. She loves us and it makes us love us better. Sonia gives us permission to live aloud inside our magic, to not be confined to definition and taught me to own the space I was in while I was in it. Bits and pieces of all of us around the planet become whole when we discover you one poet at a time. The first time I found you, you saved my life. From the narrow curriculum of my Detroit public high school, you were there sitting on a library bookshelf with Audre Lorde and Endozaki Shange and Lucille Clifton and Alice Walker and Toni Morrison and Octavia Butler. Confusion and displacement and cultural abandonment was lifted from my 16-year-old body. I have mothers and they spoke in beautiful tongues, quick wit and metaphor. I've been a woman and I know we are bad people. We have fallen into our collective depressions when artist paranoia is at full steam, when we just need to watch a comedy to boost our immune system. We open your books, we find your heart. When our last lover has been swallowed up by insecurity, when we don't know how we will make it through winter on poems, we call on your hand grenades, we conjure your sanku spells, your eyes closed going awayness your hypnotic chants, your exalted whispers, your self-love walk around the stage stance. If she loves you, you already know. You need apple cider vinegar, raw almonds, and coconut water on the road. That you must find the food that will hydrate your soul so you don't run out of energy. So we continue to continue in the spirit of Langston and Maya and Baraka and Ruby. We, resistance community women, educators, mothers, together, together at our seams, you hold us. It seems surreal to share a conversation with someone who took words and made it global testimony. Call on poets from around the world to rap a city called Philly and something called peace in the form of haiku. Chalk on the sidewalk piece, poster at the bus stop piece, mural against red brick piece, internal piece, single mother's piece, our brothers for peace, spinning while standing still, you, vertical woman with 12 hands, twin babies in fire water, your poems are our secret ammunition when they mispronounce our names on purpose, our conscience for some women who sell their baby girls for the high, those women who love Malcolm, who understand that language is weapon and tongues are sharpened swords in Joburg, I watch you quiet a room in seconds. When the stool is not tall enough, you walk away from that podium and we see you. This petite lioness, this petite lioness commanding every breath in a space, reminding us we have to still fight to be taught our own history, our own writers in our own schools. Does your house have Sonia Sanchez? Does your house have peace of mind? Does your room spin when Sonia enters? Does everything seem clearer once you have her in your reach? Sonia, we in Brooklyn, we in Detroit, 
We in Oakland. We in Philly. We in Louisville. We in London. We in South Africa. We spin for you. We flower bed community safe place for you. We will catch you when you need us to. Thank you. Brad, come away from the camera a little bit. Just a little bit. My, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank y'all. Woo. Okay. We still good? We're good on time at 720. I'm doing okay. I want to read something. You're doing great. I want you. So I don't want to interrupt this flow. You can go as long as you want to. I think, okay, you, know, tomorrow. <laughs> you know, look, um, and then we'll, we we want our folks to be able to engage you in a dialogue, but you read as many as, as more as you feel okay. like makes sense. And then we'll, you, you let us know when you're ready to talk with us. Okay. Got it. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. I appreciate y'all. Um, I want to, so I want to also say that Brad actually helped me edit this, this beautiful um, collection of poems. And I want to read this poem. I, I just make sure I have the the width, the the bandwidth to do it. Um, I have to read this poem for um, for Sandra Bland because you know that's in the tradition of what this is about. It's like social social justice work, you know. And there's a difference between a speech, right, and a poem. So I could probably be a good speech writer. I don't write speeches. Some people don't know what to call poets, black poets who can read poetry really well. So they'll say, oh, that was a nice speech. And I'd be like, brother, that was a poem, you know, because they tell us poems are just things that sound really boring. So when a poem sounds good, you don't think it's a poem anymore. And I was like, but baby, it's just a poem. That's what that's what poems sound like when you, you know, black. <laughs> so, you know. That's it. It's just like that. Not all black poets. Some people not tapped in to, to the Holy Ghost. But listen, so this is speaking of the Holy Ghost. This is a prayer, is a rant, is a call to action. I took this poem. I've done so many things with this poem. And um, Patrice, you know, uh, we talked about, you know, my film. I just wrapped up my first feature film. He looked like a postcard. Really proud of that work during the pandemic. Um, all my money was gone. I lost a lot of money. <laughs> in 2020, like everybody who's independent did. And I watched the, the gigs get canceled, like back to back. And my book, this book came out in 2020. So my book came out March of 2020. So if y'all can remember March of 2020, I was devastated. It was my first book on a, on a larger press. Very excited. I set myself up on this big national tour on my own that was headed to the UK right afterwards. I set all of that up on my own and everything got canceled. And then I had to figure out a way to to exist, <laughs> to take care of my, my my family, and um, and I found it. I found it. I just switched gears and I started doing other things. I started telling people know that we're using my black voice during the pandemic, using these corporations that were asking me to come be their black voice to look as if so they can look like they cared about black people because George Floyd was killed on on national television and or international television for that matter. And suddenly, people who never called me were calling me but they didn't want to pay me to show up. And um, so shout out to <laughs> the people who are hosting me today because I'm being paid to be here. But it's important that artists and poets, um, poets to me are the most necessary artists and the um, the the most the lowest paid. Um, and, and I've seen, because I'm friends with rappers and Patrice, you know how we feel about that. You know, I've watched my rapper friends. I know how much money they get paid, which is them and a DJ. So, and they're not, their poet, their, their poems and their rhymes are not better than mine. <laughs> they're not, they're, they're good songs, but I would say like we line, if we put the verses next to each other, I, I, if we just put them on the paper and put, laid them down and had a little look, you know what I'm saying? I'm just going to say that, you know, I'm, they, I don't know if they can keep up with what's happening with the poetry. Um, so uh, some of them, you know, could, I would name a few, like Black Thought. <laughs> I got my top five, you know what I mean? Lauren Hill, you know, I got my top five. Um, but this is We Want Our Bodies Back. And um, I wrote this as, yeah, this is what we do with poetry. So this is um, a poem. It's a prayer. And it's for Sandra Bland, because when I saw her videos, you know, she reminded me so much of myself and, and so many of the Black women that I know who, when they get put over the, by the police, that's how we talk to the police. And it, it, it really, that's why it really spoke to me because I was like, well, that could easily have been me so many times. The way I talk to police when they put me over, I don't, you know, like, 
And I, I'm grateful in that I live in a city where I get pulled over by a police that look like me. So in Detroit, it has been dwindling down. But we do have a black folks on the police force. We do have people that live in our city, that police in our city. It's not mandated the way it was under Coleman A. Young. Shout out to Coleman A. Young. I'm a Coleman A. Young baby. And y'all don't know. The, you got to you got to Google Coleman A. Young to know what that means. But that means I grew up with a black mayor that was a black mayor for 20 years. That shaped my life. Black mayors, schools with black school boards and black teachers. Not all black teachers. At Cody, I had white teachers. My English teacher, Miss Story, was, Miss Story, my drama teacher, who's a white woman, who just came to Black Women Rock, <laughs> who's still in my life, who's, who introduced me to Indazaki Shange. It was a white, white, wild, crazy white woman teacher who loved her students. You could be white and help the black students. You got to love them, though. You don't love my students. You don't love the babies. Get away from the babies. Susan Story loved us. She still does. So anyway, this is We Want Our Bodies Back. And um, it's for all women like me who get pulled over by police for no good reason at all. Um, but I'm alive to talk about it and Sandra Bland is is uh, is dead. If black women could be cut down, no, removed gently from American terrorism, who would break our fall? Which direction would we travel to feel safe, wild is the wind? If we could turn in this skin, these sharpened bones, this brain full of power and history, who would we resemble? Invisible doesn't come in black. How many nervous breakdowns? How many funeral black dresses? How many fibroids? How many nooses? How many of our bodies must be raped, cut into pieces, burned inside, garbage bags buried? How many of us blossom a beautiful tree of life and pray their pride isn't cut down the middle, reduced to trunks, or a close friend doesn't die climbing their limbs, attempted to simply grow outside the gritty soil they were planted? I put a spell on you. Holly Hobby ovens, Girl Scout cookies and Barbie dolls. Don't prepare our revolutionary daughters born with capes and wings to have a pig's knee pushed into their backs. Girls raised by wolves taught to disappear, to be quiet, to not talk about it. How much black breath is allowed space in the state of Texas, a place that, is, a place that has sucked the life out of countless, miscounted, uncounted, brown, poor women die here. I got life. Sandra Bland got the death penalty for a traffic stop. Her body was 28 years young. How to make sense of our bodies, bodies burnt by cigarettes, bodies smoked out their own neighborhoods, bodies with abandoned lungs and hearts, bodies mistaken for women when they are still girls. How do we construct a survival guide, a poem for our daughter's bodies without throwing up our breakfast? How do our mother's bodies not implode after telling our sons to comply, to not speak up, to keep their heads down, to allow their bodies to be dragged by racist police? Jim Crow ain't never flown with this much wingspan. Eagles running for safety now, for the reach is deep in Southern and Midwest, shadows the East, lands in the West. Texas, you will always be Mexico in denial. Poet Ron Allen asked for his body back in 1996, and we're still waiting. We want our bodies back. We want our bodies back. We want our bodies back. We want the return to mothers without blood, without brains exposed, without humiliation, without bruises, without glass, without fire. We want our bodies back. We want our cities back, our culture back. We want our land back, our streets back, our freedom, our justice. We want our bodies back. We want our bodies back. We want our bodies back. We want them wrapped in white silk. We want them paraded around the White House. We want these flags who stand up for baseball games at half mass. We want national holidays to honor our bodies, our knees, our prayers, our ears, our genitals, our eyes, our fingers, our feet. We want 21 gun salutes when we enter a room. We want our bodies back. We want them anointed in oils. We want them worn around your neck. We want them remember. We want them worship on Sunday. We want our magic you try to bottle. We want our essence you attempt to steal. We want our elegance, our sex, our walk, our cool, our recipes, our intelligence, our science, our stars, our history. I want my Moroccan nose. I want my holy water breast. I want my side legs. I want my alien arms. I want my Ivy Coast mouth. I want our breath back. I want our time back. I want your foot off our girl's backs. I want all your badges back. I want you to evaporate into dust like swatted moths. Don't cut me down from the noose. Let my legs dangle for the devil. What a spectacular magic show. Why you turn the cameras off? Why you turn the cameras off? This is a simple ballet. You got front row. This is your venue. This cell, this hole is... No one's home. It's no place for a woman to die. You probably never heard of Judith Jameson, Catherine Dunham. Oh, you, we know how to get our legs in the air. Oh, we know how to get our legs in the air. We know how to elevate, use our bodies to tell a story of middle passage, of survival, of lynchings. You have always left our bodies under your control. Don't you touch me. Don't take me down. Don't touch my body. Don't touch my music. Don't touch my patience. Don't touch my car door. Don't come near my window. Don't talk to me in that tone. 
this body of work got work to do. I'm resurrecting my body in new forms daily. Watch for me in your deepest sleep. Black is the color of my true love's hair. Listen for my songs. Watch for my walk. Listen for my voice, my black girl attitude. Watch my body resist your death trust. Watch me rise. Watch my rebirth. Watch us rise up from this new Jim Crow, from these new unspoken apartheid laws. We want our bodies back. We want our bodies back. We will take them, protect them, remember them, remind you, remember you, Sandra Bland. We will never forget your brown body, your mind, your pride, your spirit, your love, your vow to do God's work. We want your drive from Illinois to Waller County back. We want all our daughters back and we want them back now. So I wrote that for Sandra Bland. And if you notice, I put uh, Nina Simone records inside of the piece and I call out Nina Simone records because in this work, you have to have something that grounds you so you don't go mad. <laughs> so you don't absolutely just get depressed. So you don't just be without hope. And um, when I was writing the poem, you know, it was like a really kind of, it just kind of came out of me. I needed Nina, I brought Nina Simone's energy in it because she's one of my models as an artist, a kind of artist that I, you know, would love to be and be compared to like, not because I can sing like Nina Simone, but the choices that she made are similar to the choices that I made. So why people like Oprah made, took, took 25 years for her to know who I am, right? Not that she didn't know who I was, but really to be like, I've been doing this work for a long time, but sometimes people do the work their whole lives and nobody in another space like that ever says their name. And that's not for nothing. Like it's, it's, it's a very, it's a problem. It's a problem with our community. So there's the disconnect, right? When you become, I watch my, my friends who are famous rappers and comedians now like become famous and then the disconnect happens. Like I'm still connected to them, but like it's harder to reach people once they're like in a certain space, right? Phone numbers change. They ain't not on Facebook for real no more. They not running their Instagram account. Like it changes. I'm, my life is different than what it was in 95 as it should be. I, you know, I don't do open mics anymore. <laughs> I, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't do that. You know what I mean? I, I, I have to make a living. So my work is in a different space. Um, but I, I can, I'll sneak into open mic and check out who's doing it and, and go look at it. And if I feel like it, I jump on the mic just for my own satisfaction to show them I can still, I still got it. But but yeah, there is, um, yeah, but the but Nina Simone, which is what I brought up in the first place, is like that centering for me and bringing her, calling her her, her songs. Because um, Nina Simone didn't go out the way she deserved to. We celebrate her now, but did we celebrate her then, right? Um, the way she deserved to be lifted up. You know, she gave so much to the civil rights movement. You know, my I was friends uh, with Weldon Irvine, who co-wrote To Be Young, Gifted and Black. He was my dear friend. And he passed away in a very, very sad kind of way, you know, took his own life. And I think about the man who helped co-wrote, co-write to be young, gifted and black. What happened that, that he's not with us anymore? You know, um, look what happens to artists who, you know, who often uh, die without the money they deserve, the recognition, the awards, you know. And I have moments, speaking of Sonia Sanchez, when I can, you know, because I've been an independent black publisher since... Uh, it was 1997, I started More Black Press. And I never cared about having a book deal with any major white press or anything like that. I do it now because I'm grown and I need the positioning and I need the distribution. <laughs> it's just simple as that. It's not because I think they're putting a stamp of approval or I need them to validate me as a poet. It's just because I need. I don't got time to go to the post office. I'm, I'm so grown and I'm so busy and I'm traveling in the world. And I just, I used to be in my twenties, like wrapping up all the books and going to the post office. Nobody got time for that. So it's a positioning thing for me and um, and a transition for me as a entrepreneur in a in a in a, a publishing house to grow in that way. Um, but it was never my intention um, to yeah to. I just I like being independent. I like being able to write what I want to write, not someone telling me what to write. Um, I like being in that power position. So it's 734. So what I want to suggest, just for the sake of the spirit of the of the people that are here is that if people have questions that I can we can open up to questions and I can still close out with poetry and I think that's a cool way to do it where we can have a conversation and then I can close out with a poem or two at the end to kind of yes so that's that's I'm glad that you transitioned that way I it, it, we're about an hour in and so that's where I wanted to to move as well Okay. And so first of all, before we do that, let me just say thank you so much for what's been a, a rich, rich, rich reading. 
Um, but you have leaned all the way into this Sonia Sanchez spirit. You uh, series you've channeled Sister Sonia and the the work of of black art and poetry as a form of activism. Yeah. One of the things that you said, and I, I really want to open this up to our audience to be able to to engage you in a dialogue and answer the questions. But you were just talking about Nina Simone and the grounding work, but also your your channeling of. Of Sister Sonia, who's still with us, but you opened up early on saying that poetry is ancestor work. Yeah. Um, and that really spoke to me. And I, and I was just thinking about that and I was thinking about like, what is the significance to you of that kind of ancestor work mm. as it relates to poetry as a form of justice work? Wow. Um... Yeah, I mean, I'm real close. I, it's, I just, I just um, wrote a, a record, and one of the songs is called Jim Crow, and I speak my gra my grandmother's name, Annie Mae Gillum. So my daddy, if he was alive, would have been, I think, 96 years old. So my daddy was like a granddaddy age. He was about much uh, older than my mother when they were together. So my grandmother and grandfather were born um, in the late 1800s. So I, you know, and so I feel very like it's so. So I'm like, you know, maybe one generation away from plantation slavery, you know, right in the South. Um, I also have indigenous, um, indigenous blood on that side too. But you know, it's Africans and indigenous people, which are the same people having babies in the South. And so um, I've always felt very connected to, you know, I, the, I think the line is Annie Mae Gillum um, and Barely Moore. I love them. I know them. Um, I love him. I know him or something. I know him. I love him. Something never met him. So like these, I've of course never met <laughs> my grandmother and grandfather. My father's side, I was much too young. I came much too later in, in, the, in life. Um, but I feel very connected to them. Right. And um, yeah, ancestor work is, you know, knowing. I, I, and then my daddy died in 94. And my life changed very fast. And like I went from like, you know, just reading poems at my daddy's funeral to I mean, it was like a year later, maybe I was on, I was, you know, I was I moved to New York. I never would have left um, Detroit unless my daddy had died. So that was like my daddy in spirit pushed me out of Detroit and said, go, go to Brooklyn. And so I just believe in spirit world. I feel very connected to ancestors who are with me um, because I know when I read, like there's, you know, when I'm writing, I'm by myself. But when I'm, when I begin to read, I know that I've never been alone. And um, you, I bring, uh, you bring all of that with you. You bring, you know, I mean, I've been, I'm well read. You know, I didn't, I, I've been reading Fanon and Dr. Dr. Clark. <laughs> Kwame Ture was my hero. I've been reading scholarly work um, on my own. Uh, trying to tell, instilling my son, like these schools are not going to teach you who you are <laughs> and who we are. Um, so since I was like 16, 17, you know, um, so I've been, yeah, I've been I've been walking in the line of you know ancestor where like people who've been here before us like because without them where who how do we exist <laughs> you know we're we're the ones they couldn't kill you know is a hashtag I made up for my play Salt City I wrote this piece um, called Salt City it's a techno choreo poem that actually opens at the Apollo Theater next year and really beautiful piece Aku Kodogo who is the woman in yellow in for Color Girls um so in the line of Indazaki. Uh, work. Um, I have this legendary sister choreographer directing and choreographing the work. But Salt City is about um, Salt, a, a story of Salt. And she's born to the Salt Mines, which is in which is very much a Detroit thing. But she's in the future past and she travels to the future and can't find her people. And they have forgotten who they are. And so that's what I mean. Like, you know, for me, you know, bringing ancestor, ancestor work, meaning like I never forget where I came from. I understand that the work that I'm doing, even as a griot and as a poet and as an activist and artist, that this is, I'm not some phenomenon. Yeah, I don't like that when they make us phenomenons. Like even when the little sister did the poem for Joe Biden, Amanda, like Gorman, like she's, you know, they, you know, when white folks talk about her, they act like she fell out the sky. She didn't fall out the sky. She been listening to me. She been listening to something like she know who I am. She been listening to us. Like she, in her poem, she did her job. She did a good job on the poem, but when you hear, I heard white people came up to me asking me about it, and they're like, oh, it's the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my whole life. I said, I know so many black girls that write poems like that in their 20s. What are you talking about? I wrote poems like that in my 20s. But it's about 
you know, and so, because that's ancestor were like, don't, it's not magical where she came out of the heavens. Amanda is from, is from a, a, a cultural tradition. <laughs> it's been handed to her from people who came before her. And I recognize that. And so that's what I mean by ancestor work. You, I'm never by myself on a stage. I'm never by myself on a Zoom. I'm never, it's never just us, even the physical, in the physical form here. Like we are, we are, that's the people, it's a, you know, thing that people say now about our ancestors' greatest wish, but we are, like we are. And so um, I'm just really, I have a, a, a understanding of that. So I scare men away. So it's hard for me to date because <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I just wanted to lighten up the room. So yeah. Um, so yeah, but it, it does carry weight, right? And I do recognize that I come from a great people and I walk in that. Okay, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that 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 answer. I, I really want to just open it up to the room. And to me, I don't know if if people can be unmuted to ask questions. I know, I think Jessica would love to hear from people, but we can, we can put questions in the chat as well. Where is uh, it? Oh, there it is. But but you let I me know it. to me how best to, to proceed <laughs> with the Q&A and the dialogue. Hey, we hear Everyone the can unmute. Yeah. Everyone can unmute and turn on cameras too. Oh, someone named Monique says, the words don't fit in my mouth freed me. Your poem, I'm in love with potential, got me out of a shady, situation oh yeah they be shady don't they thank you for sharing your gifts um i'm in love with potential yeah that's a poem i wrote uh it's funny like black elegance magazine i was a cover of black elegance magazine with like at that time my boyfriend but we had like broken up but we still were on the cover of the magazine like by the time the magazine came out we were already broken up we laugh about it right now we're really good friends <laughs> to this day but they published that poem uh i'm in love with potential yeah because that's when you're young you know um you like just fall in love with what somebody can be. And so when you grow up, you're like, no, I, you got to love people like who they are at that moment because they're not going to change. <laughs> so can't, can't, can't like, you know, make somebody something else. They are who they are. Love them in that moment. Um, but thank you for that, Monique. Tell us your crap habits. And you have, I, I'll read the poem for Justice Brown. I'll definitely, I'll read that before we, um, before we close out. I promise it's right here on a piece of paper. I got it. Um, do your craft habits. Meaning like the craft of writing. I drink a lot of tea. I drink tea. I'm so stereotypical. I I do like burn can. I'm a can. I love candles. If you want to send me presents, I like candles. Uh, I, I do burn sage. Um, my space, my home, because I've been through. I've been married twice, and so my home. I have a, a beautiful home I bought in Detroit in a neighborhood um, that's a black historic neighborhood. Is where like. Aretha used to live and Smokey Robinson and all those cool people lived right in this neighborhood. And um, so I bought a 1924 house here. It's really, you know, old and beautiful. And um, I like old homes and uh, yeah, the character it brings. But um, yeah, I forgot the point I was making even to be honest. <laughs> what was the question again? I don't know. Oh, oh craft habits. So I, yeah, I write at night a lot. And, uh, and it's a very solid kind of space. Um, and sometimes I write with music. I like to have music. I write in the shower. I wrote a rock and roll album. Um, it's called Rock and Roll N-I-G-G-A. I spell it with sixes. I won't say the word, um, but that's the name of the album. And, um, and you can feel free to ask me kinds of questions about that, but it's uh, uh, 10 songs. It's, uh, it's I, I don't know if you know who Patti Smith is, but it's Patti Smith is one of my, favorite artist and so she's a rock artist. What's funny about Patti Smith is that like um if I was white, they would compare me to Patti Smith. I'm a poet that makes rock and roll music, but because I'm a black girl, nobody puts me in the same sentence with Patti Smith. So I always put myself in context because I know I'm so Patti Smith. I'm always gonna get a t-shirt that says I'm so Patti Smith. So I am so Patti Smith and she has roots in Detroit and um she's a great poet and and does and, and a rock artist. And so she had a record called rock and roll N-I-G-G-R back in the 60s. That was for Jimi Hendrix. That was very controversial. Um, and so for me, the title and the in the in the in the work itself, um, it's a very radical um, album. It's very it's very feminine and it's very um, sexually powered. It's very politically powered and um, I have a lot to say on the album, but it's uh, it's really it's a black rock and roll album. But it's in its poetry um, with very Stephanie Christian is an amazing songwriter and vocalist, and she is destroying this record. And I wrote it for her voice. Um, 
but it's um, very much on purpose. The name of the title of the album was going to be The Fire This Time, which was a nod to James Baldwin, but I felt like it was too safe. And so we gave it a, a more radical title so that we can talk about this thing called um, inclusion and rock and roll and that we um, have this open conversation about why Black women are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on the level that they should be on and that they're not um, educated. People don't educate in music historians, you know, in schools, they're not being taught about this music that they created. And um, I'm working to change that. And so for us, the, the title was so that we could engage the conversation. Um, the people talk about black women and rock and roll and how we're treated, not just by white rock radio stations, but by black urban radio stations that don't play our music. So this record is an attempt for me to get urban radio to play some rock and roll <laughs> and then not to be able to like recognize that the music is really good. So they got to play it. So um, do my poems ever surprise you? Do you do your poems ever surprise you? Do you go to write something and discover that there were other words that needed to come out instead? Yeah, all the time. I mean, yeah, they always I'm always like, oh, did I get excited? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes and then sometimes poems come out very fast and I'm inspired. Like I was on the last three Common projects and I love Common. Shout out to Common. My brother Rashid out of Chicago. I'm on Beautiful Revolution 1 and 2, myself and Morgan Parker, uh, which is you a know, very different kind of poet who's based on the West Coast. But it was really great that Common had me and Morgan on his records um, bookending him, right? And so, but Kareem Riggins is uh, the producer. So when Kareem Riggins from Detroit, incredible, incredible drummer and producer, worked with Glasper and um, all kinds of people. Esperanza Spalding produced her album. Um, and Kareem sends me music. And like not everyone who sends me music, I don't get inspired that way. But when Kareem sends me music, I can write to his work pretty quickly. I can tap. There's an the energy in his music that I love, and I can just write. Like, so common when I did the first album, they're like, okay, we need you to do that in the second album. So when they called me, literally, like, you know, common called and said, this is what it is, this is the concept. And I was like, all right, give me a minute. And I like literally hung up the phone and like wrote it and called them back and sent it to them. And they were going crazy. <laughs> they're like, yo, they're trying to FaceTime me. I wasn't even cute enough to be FaceTime. And I was like, I'm not answering that FaceTime call. Are you crazy right now? So, yeah. And so sometimes it just comes out. And um, and I and I always I'm always surprised because I don't know what's about to happen. You start to write and then you're like, OK, now what's about to happen? And then you get to inside of the poem. You're like, oh, I think I wrote something that was kind of good. You know, it's a like very exciting process. Um, and then like Brad, who's on this call, like he gets, it's, you know, a poor Brad, like he gets the calls because I have to like know if it's good. And so you always got to find somebody that is like your person. Brad's like definitely on that list of people that I have to call to say, okay, is it good? Does it suck? Is it corny? You know, I never want to sound corny. I, there's a lot of poets that, oh my God, it's very corny. And so, and but normally when it's like corny, it's because people don't think they need to read. So you cannot be a good poet if you don't read. <laughs> you got to read something other than your own poems <laughs> in order to be a good poet. You can't just be like, I'm so great. I'm going to read myself. You can't do that. Um, yeah, and then do do I sometimes discover I need to say something else and say, yeah, like the Jim Crow poem I wrote um, initially, the song is a poem song on the record that will be coming out at some point. Um, I wrote it, I was inspired by what, what was happening with Kamala Harris, our vice president, um, because people were attacking her blackness. And it really bothered me um, the way that some of these groups um, are just on some divide and conquer type business and trying to separate our sister from from her community. And so it bothered me. And so inside the song, I was I was actually saying her name. I used her name and I did all this stuff and I used it. And then I got some feedback from um, a, a fellow artist who I was letting listen to the record. And he's like, ah, maybe take her name out of it and then speak to the issue because her name is gonna distract from what you're actually trying to talk about, which was Jim Crow and new apartheid laws and black light skin versus dark skin. And this is silliness that we have that separates our community to this day. Um, and it really helped. Um, so like being able to like be open to feedback um, and constructive criticism is really important if you are a writer or poet. 
Um, you can't just think your stuff don't stink. You got to be like, oh, well, you know what? You're actually right. It would be better if I did this. And I would be remiss if I did not show this book because we're talking about Sonia Sanchez. And this book, SOS Calling All Black Poets, a Black Arts Movement Reader, um, um, is uh, edited by John Brands, by Bracey, who's amazing, um, Sonia Sanchez and Jane Smethurt. Like this book is like the Bible. It's an intense. So get this SOS. If you're teaching, teaching, I've used it um, when I'm doing residency work, um, but putting us in, you know, in proper context. But this is if you want to know about the Black Arts Movement writers, Sonia will put this book up. So I'm doing that because she'd be mad at me if I didn't. So, um, so there's that. Shout out to Mary Baraka. Is that someone shouting? Amir, I, I I love Amiri and I and I miss him uh, dearly. I don't know if I'm going back to see if there's something else. Um, another, any other questions? You even wrote a film prodigy. Oh, oh, thank you, Booker. Ah, so nice, my friend Booker. Uh, yes, I wrote a film. Um, you know, the pandemic allowed the time to shift. You've done phenomenal. These are people just saying nice things. Oh, thank you, thank you, Booker. Beautiful as always. I appreciate you. Um, so other people have questions. I don't. I certainly don't want to. You know. To- talk too much and and but I want everybody to have a chance while we have uh Jessica here with us yeah uh, so ask questions I'm just kind of reading the chat but yeah if anyone has a question I'm I'm here for it I could just read another poem <laughs> yeah being scared to ask me a question so it's, it's also that y'all want to know how I raised like almost half a million dollars for my film by myself there's that. I did that like by myself. And I didn't, none of my rich friends helped me. Um, it was a learning experience. We're in post with He Looked Like a Postcard. Um, I, you know, I tapped into the resources and the people that I thought loved my work and had maybe some money in the bank. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I didn't do a GoFundMe. Um, I didn't ask for donations. I, I asked for investors and said, I want you to invest in me. So we're in post with the film. We are hoping to get accepted by a festival. Festivals are very um, racist, <laughs> unfortunately. And the ones that you kind of need to premiere at aren't always open to black stories. Um, but I'm excited to be now, not just a poet, but a screenwriter. So I wrote the film, I might sure I have to remember to say that. And I pr- was a producer in the film and I, and I executive produced it. I raised all the funds for it. And um, it's been a really amazing process. And so we're at the finish line. We're hoping the film will be done by next month and then we'll start to send it to festivals and get in one of them. So y'all look for, it's a love story. It stars um, Tobias Trevelyan, who's a wonderful, wonderful human being and beautiful soul um, out of Newark, New Jersey, one of my other favorite cities. Um, With my brother Raz out there, Baraka. And um, Donnell Rawlings is in the film, comedian and, just, you know, Nicole Gilbert, who, who went to school with me, um, lead singer for Brownstone. And she came out of that black box theater at Cody High School. So I wanted her to play my best friend in the film. And so what one thing I will say about that is that, you know, never write yourself out of your own story. And so when the director, Kasim Basir, um, when he read the script and came over to my house and told me he wanted to direct the film, he was like, you're going to be in it. And I immediately said, um, no not going to be in it. I'd like to coach, you know, some young sister and help her with the poetry because I'm play serendipity is the main character and Motown is uh, Tobias's character. And so I took 24 hours to think about it because he was like, you know, okay, he accepted that I said no. And then I called him the next day. I said, well, are you saying you're the director? Would you cast me? Because do you think I just want to be in a movie? Because I'm not interested in being a movie. I'm interested in seeing the movie get made. And he said, you have to do the film. And so I was like, you know, I was aging myself out of my own story. I was doing what Hollywood would have done to me. um, And it was silly, you know, but I did have that that moment of like the easy out would have been for me just to produce the film because I love to produce and and I'm good at producing. Um, Now I'm directing and producing my first documentary film, Daughters of Betty. So I am doing the doc on this almost 20 year year movement, rock and roll movement with all these incredible sisters. And so this this one got shot with six cameras. We did all these interviews. And so the goal is to spend 2023, the rest of 22 into 23, getting this thing polished and beautiful. 
and and premiering it at some festivals, you know, maybe in late 23 or 24, whatever. But it's that's my directorial debut. I'm very I love film and and I you know, I mean I that's what pandemic did. You know, I shifted gears and and tapped into some other talents that you know are inside of you, things that you think you can do. But I'm so busy gigging and doing gigs and working that pandemic sat me down. So I had to figure out something else to do with myself. And so I made a film. And and I'm thinking I'm not that I'm working. I always say that to people like, oh Jessica, you're working nonstop. It's not that I'm working. I'm investing. I've been investing in myself for the last couple of, I mean investing in myself for my whole career. <laughs> I mean my first four books like these are these are more black press books. These are not Harper Collins books. And this is the words don't fit in my mouth that the person referenced. You know, this is God is not an American. This is more black press books. These are more black press books. Just so we're clear. This is this is what I've been doing. Not to count the, all the other people that books I made. Saul Williams' first book, Raz Baraka, Danny Simmons. I'm doing Brad's book. He's on here. Brad's Brad's with the big time. Brad's gonna get distributed by Harper Collins and Amistad. So happy to continue to do the work. I just couldn't do it in the same way I was doing it. But I did those people's books. I did Danny Simmons' full color, you know, expensive book, you know. Um, and uh, and I love him still. You know, he's one of my favorite authors on the press. And um, Asha Bandeli's book, you know, and. And so I've been pouring myself and money and putting my skin in the game um, for a long time. And it it doesn't stop. You know, I, I enjoy being part of the work, you know, because no one's ever taken care of me like that. And so I don't even know what that feels like to to not be to be taken care of in a way where I don't have to worry about anything. So I'm always and I really enjoy investing um, energy in the books are like babies to me, um, but just so we're clear, like you do, I've been doing this first and, and then this one came along <laughs> and it's cool. I could have done this too. You know, I, I even like my covers better, to be honest. Um, so, but I, you know, this was a good learning experience and I learned from working with Harper and uh, it's, I was the first black woman poet to be published by them since Gwendolyn Brooks. So big shoes to fill, which is why having a press that's a, a black woman owned press with distribution through Harper is a major, a major accomplishment and uh, a major move. And um, I hope that in years to come, it'll be something really special. So just getting started. Be excited about that. It's 757. OK, so people are asking me to read this poem. So I was asked. I was, on say, I was muted. So I was saying thank you so much. So we are coming up on eight o'clock, which is about the time that we had expected. And Teams is now giving me the you've got five minutes left in your scheduled meeting time. I don't know if that's. I don't think they're going to kick us off, but it, but it's a good you know it's it's a good place to say. Look, thank you so much for everything that you shared. We've appreciated all the questions and the dialogue. And I know you've you've got a request for a poem to read. And, and I know some it might not have been the last poem that you wanted to read. So if you want to read that poem and if you have maybe one more that you want to read to take us home uh, and then we will say good night. OK, as long as we don't get cut off. When you get cut off, y'all follow me on Instagram, OK, and say <laughs> and say hi to me. I'm Jessica Kiermore on Instagram. I am on Instagram. The other things I don't know, not so much, but um, I like Instagram because I like pictures. Uh, <laughs> it's not for a deep reason. I just like photos. Uh, for Katanji Brown Jackson, uh, I was asked by uh, my sister Jotaka to say something on Sunday. It could have just been like a hallelujah or a grateful or a prayer. And so this is what I said. A crescendo of little girls affording themselves an imagination. Line up for the front line polka dot dresses, striped ankle socks, and black shoes. They watch the world from this place they've been told is the battlefield. They only know what their mouths, what their stomachs have told them. Their hearts connected by a thread of courage men have yet to own. In this monumental moment, a little girl in pigtails named Katanji is coloring on her father Johnny's lap. He is balancing law school and possibility is delicately being wrapped around a daughter who does not know boxes or boundaries. Hope is embedded in the bloodline, in her bloodline gift. She safely uses her imagination to draw her life the bright, beautiful way she sees it. So when a high school counselor told Katanji her sights were too high, she was not discouraged. With focus, with intim without intimidation, she spoke her dreams of Harvard into existence. She did what all black girls are forced to do when told by others they are not fit for prom queen or lead anchor or tenure or CFO or vice president for that matter. 
a nation built on the backs of black women without a singular representative representative reflected in the highest court in the land until you number 116 somebody probably told harriet that she was not fit enough to make it to freedom someone told rosetta thought black girls do not play electric guitar someone might have told katanji she would never be but here you stand necessary justice Black girls carry constellations inside their wombs, waiting to be named. This one exceptional star, Katanji Brown Jackson, assembled eloquently by ancestors' prayers, manufactured by four mothers who inhale and breathe out survivors, warriors, living testimony of the divine feminine. No more silence swept under an audience, left out of history books, the emancipation of a house and Senate floor. They can walk off, but your voice won't be ignored. You unshook, unbothered, poised for position, smile beautifully as Malcolm in the face of his enemies. Thank you to the 53 who understood this court would never be supreme without the reflection of this brilliant, deserving queen. Who else but us to celebrate, to reach back for you, the same revolutionary way Alice Walker came for Zora. We from a legacy of unrecognized frontline women and the ones they pretend not to know, Rosa, Coretta, Fanny, Sojourner, Betty, Harriet, Ida B. Wells, Katanji's crown shines so our girls can speak. All this magic rooted deep, mountain high, Euphrates deep. Our bodies hold all our honesty. We recognize the majesty. The journey bows down to destiny. This is close to the best that we wait till you meet the rest of me. The way our sisters simply cross a street, make dinners, make laws, make hearts get weak. Benin bronze mixed with Cherokee, Senegalese and Southern trees, Creole crafted country, Congo red clay, you remember me. All stories travel through us, the ancient and the new ones. Our crown shines for the, our crown shines for the doers, the black nerds and the coolest. Won't she do it? Find a smile in the darkest narrative. Dust off that gold, adjust your crown. We see you, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, wearing it, even when you not wearing it. Your crown shines. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. We appreciate all of this. Listen, um, our our program co coordinator, D Demi Warden, has put in the chat, please, before you go, make sure that you fill out the survey so that you can give us all the wonderful feedback um, from this event. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing space with us. Thank you so much, Jessica Caremore, for pouring out your heart and your soul and doing that good ancestor work. Thank you. From, here a, in this from a chair. It's hard to it's hard to read poems from a chair. <laughs> virtual space. So we we appreciate everything that you brought to us. And we got to figure out how to get you here in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm coming. I want to come. I miss Louisville. Yeah, and I yeah, wanna... yeah, yeah. And so with that, because I feel like we've been in uh, Deaf Poetry Jam, I think Russell would just say, thank y'all for coming. <laughs> God bless you. And good night. <laughs> good night. All right. I love y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing space with me. And yeah, stay in touch, please. And I hope to be in Louisville. God willing. Thank so you. Nice. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank y'all for listening. I can see your beautiful faces, and even though you're just initials, I can still see you. <laughs> but I can feel you. Thank you for the for the beautiful chat. We want you here. I want to come, Cynthia. I'm coming. Mm -hmm. So y'all, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Thank you thank so you. much. This is wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming on camera. I needed the energy. Thank you.